Throughout the Middle Ages, theological discourse regarding the angelic hierarchy was all over the place. Scholars were presenting diverse perspectives that either expanded upon the existing framework by authors such as Pseudo Dionysius or St. Thomas Aquinas, or proposed entirely new classifications, those that have since made a bit of a muddle for us, the modern audience, to really understand the classification of angels. For the traditional believer, there isn't really much of a distinction between angels, aside from the Archangel Michael, who many might see as a principal figure amongst his kind. This makes sense, because the standard Bible really doesn't make an effort to get us, the reader, to comprehend the complexities of angels, their powers, or what type of angels even supposedly exist. Instead, angels in the Bible often fall into the reader's periphery, and do find themselves seconded to either the prophets of the story, or the main narrative itself. Still, this has not stopped us from being fascinated with angels, and the fact that they are celestial beings that are shrouded in so much mystery has only increased our intrigue for them. We have the author Pseudo Dionysius to thank for the main classification of angels that few really know about. Now, Pseudo Dionysius is a bit of a wild card to acknowledge when consulting ancient texts, because the works by this author in question have since been classified as forgeries. Whilst the author attempted to identify himself in his most popular work, Corpus Dionysiacum, as Dionysius the Aeropagite, an Athenian convert of Paul the Apostle, who is actually noted in the Bible, modern scholarship recognizes such work at best as Pseudopigrapha, hence his name Pseudo Dionysius. Nonetheless, his work on the celestial hierarchy appeared to have great influence on scholasticism and has contributed greatly to the modern interpretation of the hierarchical structure relating to angels. In the work on the celestial hierarchy, Pseudo Dionysius appeared to have drawn on inspiration from biblical passages such as Ephesians 121 or Colossians 116, those that use the term powers, rulers, and authorities as, in some interpretations, not only nouns to exemplify God's power, but to delineate actual classifications of angels. This concept gained even more traction when it was adopted by influential philosopher and theologian Thomas Aquinas, who in his work, Summa Theologica, presented the same ideas by arranging the angels into three orders, sometimes known as choirs, based on their proximity to God. In the first order were the seraphim, cherubim, and the thrones, those who were the closest to God. In the second order, we have the dominions, the virtues, and the powers. Angels who exist and live in heaven, but have a direct impact on what we do on the earth. And lastly, the third order, where we have the principalities, archangels, and common angels. Dominions The dominions, sometimes known as lordships, deriving from the Latin dominium and the Greek curiotes, are believed to be responsible for the governance of cosmic movements, including stars and planets, as well as the celestial bodies, for example, the angels that are beneath them. Typically, they are believed to maintain the orderliness of the cosmos according to God's will, and can be seen to exact this order when necessary. In some beliefs, dominion angels play a role in upholding divine justice. They are the judges of the beings beneath them, and can not only be seen to explain these judgments as instructed to them by God, but can deliver them too. Additionally, these angels are also known to facilitate the execution of tasks by lower ranking angels. They lend a helping hand to the celestial bodies beneath them if and when the opportunity presents itself. In a more drastic situation, these angels are believed to intervene when someone is tainted by sin, or perhaps when someone is about to commit a sin. Some may therefore categorize the angel who stops Abraham from killing his son Isaac as a dominion, for it not only prevents Abraham from committing a terrible sin, but also delivers the message, or judgment, from God that Abraham had passed the test sent down by his God in the first place. In another interpretation, some may see the dominion angels as upholding the biblical God's original intent for creation and humanity, and that with their role as carriers of God's judgment, are seen to do their duty in upholding this ideal. Some may hearken back to the Genesis story of Sodom and Gomorrah, 
where angels, again, who can be seen as dominions under this interpretation, visit the land to determine its fate. Despite the severity of their task, these angels also demonstrate mercy by warning the righteous, which in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah only happens to be Lot and his family. Some may also see dominions as angels who appear in times of great conflict, such as battles, wars, or great calamities. As it is their duty to ensure order, it would make sense why these angels may present themselves in particularly troubling times, in order to perhaps mitigate the damage being caused, or maybe diffuse the situation so as to avoid a greater onslaught that could threaten the balance of the cosmos or threaten their god's divine intent. In other beliefs and interpretations, dominion angels are believed to respond to the prayers of global leaders, providing insights and guidance in decision-making process across various domains. Virtues As documented in the Etymologies by Archbishop Isidore of Seville, the virtues are recognized for their mastery over the natural elements, where they oversee phenomena such as storms, earthquakes, and hurricanes. These celestial beings also play a crucial part in facilitating miracles and nurturing human faith in the divine. The virtues are often described as angels of nature, or angels that have some authority over nature and the natural elements. Through this, one may consider the virtues in the same light that early civilizations of Mesopotamia may have considered deities like Enlil, who was responsible, in part, as an agricultural deity or storm deity, providing rain for crops. The virtues by the same manner are believed to govern the day-to-day -day of the weather, providing the earth with just the right amounts of rain, wind, and sunlight, whilst also delivering the more extreme examples of weather under the command of their god. With nature residing within the virtues realm of influence, it does highlight their extraordinary power, considering that they are the ones who control the seasons, the stars, the moon, and even the sun. Additionally, the virtues are also believed to be deities who assist those who bear the burdens of infirmity, or who are experiencing hardship and need a boost in faith. Virtues by this manner are believed to fortify individuals with patience, resilience, courage, and humility, allowing them to not only face their challenges successfully, but to also do so in a manner that would be pleasing to their god. With this in mind, virtues have also come under the name strongholds, whereby they give those in need the mental and perhaps physical fortitude to overcome their problems. Furthermore, virtues are believed to perform miraculous deeds, aside from their weather manipulation, and can bestow actual miracles upon those who are the most deserving, usually saints. Through this, it is believed that it is the virtues who give saints their abilities to heal wounds, predict the future, and interpret visions and dreams. The Powers The powers are often seen to be warrior angels, centuries who form what is essentially the celestial army, or the army of heaven, basically God's anti-demonic task force. These beings, as you might imagine, defend against a more carnal evil, a spiritual evil perhaps. The powers, often coined as the authorities, which makes them also kind of sound like the heavenly version of the police, are also believed to be defenders of peace and order, who restrain the forces of evil, including demons and fallen angels, as well as casting them into detention areas or prisons. Another tradition states that the powers are believed to be angels who are locked in an eternal war with demons, who may or may not have descended from fallen angels, and that these powers also guard the border or the gateways between heaven, the earth, and hell. With this in mind, the powers bounce back and forth between celestial police officers and celestial security guards. But on top of this, they are also noted as being those who escort the souls of the recently deceased up to heaven, and then, depending on the verdict, might also escort that soul down to hell in what must be the most awkward journey ever. Additionally, the powers may also be seen to fight temptation on behalf of man, in that when Satan tempts man to do wicked things, the powers essentially give humans power so that they are able to resist. 
With this in mind, we also see that powers are noted as influencing humanity, particularly world leaders with wisdom, and perhaps guiding these leaders away from Satan and towards God, in the hopes that with this positive alignment, they will make the best decisions for mankind. In other beliefs, we also see the idea that the powers are essentially God's counter to the fallen angels, who had been cast out of heaven along with their master Lucifer. These powers, therefore, become the direct adversaries of Lucifer's angels, or the latter demons of Satan, whose primary function is to cause suffering and wickedness upon the earth. Fallen angels aren't exactly a hot topic in the Bible, but we do see the likes of Peter mentioning angels who have sinned as being cast into areas of hell. For God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Whilst not explicitly stated, it's possible that sinful angels like these are apprehended by the powers and subsequently cast into hell, or an underground prison such as the Duodale, found in the Book of Enoch. You'll also notice from Peter's description that these angels are bound in chains, which funnily enough is one of the weapons that the powers are seen to be commonly depicted with. Once more, in the Etymologies of Isidore by Archbishop Isidore, the powers are given the name powers because of their influence over evil forces, in that these are the beings called forth to overpower them should they get out of hand. With this in mind, the powers are ultimately loyal to God, and it is believed in some circles that these particular angels have never fallen from grace. On the other hand, there are some ideas that present the powers as more insidious beings. In fact, there is a belief that Lucifer was the chief of the powers before he fell from grace, and that once he did, he took these angels with him. Such an idea can be reinforced by Paul the Apostle, who tells us in Ephesians, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Alternatively, it might be said that Paul may have been referring to the literal authorities and powers that were active during this time, and not the spiritual powers presented by Pseudo-Dionysius. However, it's also interesting that early Christian priest Saint Jerome also felt the same way about the powers, saying, principalities and powers, i.e. devils or apostate angels, who before their fall were in such ranks of spirits, and who are permitted to rule over the wicked in this world of darkness, by which we are to understand the fallen angels. For as by nature and from their creation, they were the governors of this corporeal world, and were deprived of this their power on account of their pride, they received it, though limited by certain restrictions, in order to tempt man. The Principalities Sometimes known as rulers or princes, the principalities belong to the third sphere or choir of angels, this being the one that is the furthest away from God and the closest to humanity. With this in mind, it should come as no surprise that the principalities are believed to be angels that guide and protect nations, groups of people, and institutions, including the church. Indeed, these angels are very earth-centric, and do not concern themselves necessarily with the more spiritual affairs, but rather find themselves drawn to the more human experience. As you might imagine, these are the angels that humans are more likely to have the most interactions with, even though, for the most part, they are more likely to appear as rays of light. Principalities might be seen, in some capacity, as guardian angels, as they work, albeit behind the scenes, to assist humanity with political, economical, or social dilemmas. One such task the principalities find themselves in is choosing who amongst humanity will lead each nation, as well as to help that leader, much as the powers do, in finding new ideas and strategies that not only best serve humanity itself, but the intentions of God too. Alternatively, the principalities may also be seen as individual rulers themselves, who govern over specific regions on earth. Much like the powers, the principalities are also seen to give humans strength when they are in need of it, but that the principalities are more selective with whom they choose. 
For instance, some interpretations of this theory believe that it was the principalities who gave David the strength to swing the stone that killed Goliath. This wasn't a random choice on behalf of the principalities, but rather the principalities knew David had the potential to become king, and so lent him strength to facilitate this. Another instance of this could be Joseph receiving the strength to endure being sold into slavery by his brothers. For the principalities knew Joseph would become a ruler in Egypt, and thus knew that lending him the strength to see these years through would be a good investment. Conversely, you may have noticed in both Paul the Apostle's account in Ephesians and St. Jerome's account about powers that both also take aim at the principalities, lumping both angels into the same group and labeling them as evil. With this, it might be said that if the principalities are evil, or that there are evil principalities, then it's plausible that these entities that have control over world leaders or groups of people can nudge them in either the direction of good or evil, depending on which team they bat for. As with many concepts that focus on angelology, speculation ensues, though it should be noted that there is no specific hierarchy of angels revealed to us in scripture. Seraphim and cherubim are mentioned in close connection with the throne and the glory of God, but there does not appear to be mention of dominions, virtues, powers and principalities that can be unanimously corroborated as meaning an angel or some kind of celestial entity. As far as belief goes, believers might agree that angels do important work, but they are also never encouraged to fixate on them, and of course are forbidden from worshipping them. John tells of an account in Revelation where an angel himself even reprimanded him for such behaviour, reminding believers of their duty to worship their god and not angels. At this, I fell at the angel's feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters, who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give this video a like, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.